Good evening and welcome. No matter how you are a part of the Colby community, from a student to an alum, from a parent to a professor, we're so happy you're here to join us to celebrate this year's prestigious Elijah Parrish Lovejoy Award. This is actually my first time to be engaged with the Lovejoy Award as I joined Colby last year as the executive director of the Goldfarb Center for Public Affairs. Part of the Goldfarb Center's mission is to create a space to explore and discuss current events that are shaping the world today. We focus on the role of public policy, inclusive discourse for all political opinions, as well as active citizenship and leadership. Many of our events, particularly in this new virtual world where we live, are open for all to join. So I invite you to visit our website, join our mailing list, so you can stay informed and participate in these thought-provoking conversations. The theme for the Goldfarb Center this year has been the U.S. criminal justice system and racial inequalities. And through its distinct process, the esteemed Lovejoy Awards Selection Committee chose the ideal individual to honor this year. I have no doubt that tonight will be a very engaging discussion. The voice of courageous, seasoned, professional journalists have proven to be crucial in a nation where, unfortunately, misinformation and deep political divides have become the norm. I can't help but think about what Elijah Lovejoy would have thought about the year 2020. What would he have been doing? I think he would have been in the streets, like so many others, proclaiming the importance of social and racial justice. It's now my pleasure to turn the screen over to Colby College President David Green. Thank you, Kimberly. Good evening, and welcome to the 68th Lovejoy Award presentation. Since 1952, Colby has honored the legacy of our 1826 alumnus, Elijah Parrish Lovejoy, through this award for courageous journalism. Lovejoy's life and work reminds us of those who commit their lives to the pursuit of truth-telling, despite the risks this important work entails. Over the decades, Colby has awarded the Lovejoy Award to individuals who have made heroic contributions to American reporting, editing, and publishing, and we do so again tonight. The Lovejoy Award Selection Committee is comprised of the nation's top journalists. I'm indebted to them for their dedication to identifying worthy recipients of this award. I'm also inspired by their personal commitment to the principles demonstrated by Lovejoy, the critical role of a free press, the need for courage in addressing society's ills, the unyielding fight for social justice. This committee includes Martin Kaiser, retired editor and senior vice president, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and chair of the committee. Matt Apuzzo, class of 2000 from Colby, the investigative correspondent from the New York Times. Nancy Barnes, senior vice president and editorial director, NPR. Sewell Chan, editorial page editor, the Los Angeles Times. Marcella Gaveria, producer, PBS Frontline. Aminda Marquez Gonzalez, Vice President and Executive Editor Simon Schuster, and former editor of the Miami Herald, who we will see later in the program. Ron Nixon, Global Investigations Editor, Associated Press. This great committee is enriched by the contributions of Colby's Dana Professor of Sociology, Neil Gross, Vice President Ruth Jackson, Vice President Richard Uchida, and Kimberly Flowers, the Executive Director of Colby's Goldfarb Center for Public Affairs. I'm grateful to our committee members for their ongoing guidance and their passion for this important work. It has been more than 180 years since Elijah Parrish Lovejoy was gunned down defending his right to publish editorials advocating abolition of slavery. We honor him for his courage to continue publishing despite ongoing threats against him by what he called, quote, the enemies of humanity. And tonight, I would suggest we consider another reason for honoring him with thanks to this year's winner, Leonard Pitts Jr., for his expression of this insight. Pitts said, and I quote, the aspect of Lovejoy that I think still resonates today is how he represents what white people of conscience can do in the fight for racial justice. 
However, when you really break it down, it's not just a fight for racial justice, he said. It's a fight for human rights, and we all have an investment in that, no matter how it represents itself. Lovejoy would be incredibly relevant today because he looked at the fight for African-American freedom and said, no, this is my fight. And that added a different kind of weight and effectiveness, end quote. Now, the unimaginable inequality of slavery that fanned Elijah Parrish Lovejoy's passionate protest can seem an important but distant element of our history. But our world remains a place of persistent inequality, violence, and cruelty. The evidence of that is with us every day. I join many others in asking myself how I am complicit, how I benefit from racism, and what I can do to make our world more just. Lovejoy showed us a path when he elevated his voice against injustice, even though that injustice did him no personal harm. He sacrificed his life for a higher moral imperative. We owe a profound debt to Lovejoy, and we owe gratitude to those who follow in his footsteps, including this year's Lovejoy Award winner, Leonard Pitts Jr. A compelling writer, he has been articulating and exposing our society's challenges for decades through his books, his lectures, and his Miami Herald column, which is syndicated throughout the country. Like Lovejoy, Mr. Pitts faces vitriol and threats for, his express, for expressing his views in print. And like Lovejoy, he does not stop. While his opinions enrage some, they enlighten countless others. Through masterful, succinct prose, Leonard Pitts inspires his readers to act boldly, think creatively, and recognize our common humanity. We could all find a better path forward through the writings of Leonard Pitts, and tonight, we are fortunate to hear from him in dialogue with Mindy Marquez. Thank you, Mindy and Leonard, for being with us tonight. We are honored. Thank you. Thank you so much, David and Kimberly. Um, and thank you also to the selection committee for um, bestowing this honor on Leonard Pitts. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today with you, Leonard. Um, for those of you who don't know, Leonard has spent decades championing racial equity and social justice. Through his columns at the Miami Herald through, and also syndicated nationally, his books and his lectures. His work has earned him many, many accolades including a prestigious Pulitzer Prize for commentary. Yet this award, named for America's first martyr for freedom of the press, recognizes courage in journalism. And Leonard, you have shown that in spades. Over the years, your advocacy for justice and equity has come with a high personal price. Yes, there's been lots of hate mail and emails, um, which prompted your former assistant to, uh, to say that it left her vibrating with anger after opening your emails, but there's been far more serious threats. There was a um, neo-Nazi group back in 2007 that was unhappy with one of your columns and decided to publish your personal information, um, which resulted in serious threats, um, serious enough to warrant the FBI involvement and private security at your home. Happy to say that that individual is still in federal prison. And more recently, you were the victim of a swatting incident. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's when someone calls in a fake um, emergency, uh, something like a homicide or a shooting in the hopes that police will, you know, um, just all come to your home and elicit a violence, violent response. Um, luckily, that did not turn out to be the case in Leonard's case, but um, it, it was disturbing enough that on one of his recent book tours, uh, much to your chagrin, um, your, your boss and editor and my friend Nancy Ancrum took to calling bookstores in advance to just yeah. say, please watch out, you know, please make sure you, you watch out for Leonard because we're concerned about his safety. Um, so I guess this all leads me, not only to say how much you deserve this award, but how do you persevere in the face of that kind of reaction, um, including when it impacts your family, your children? Well, I'm more concerned if the children may be in the line of fire. The, the 2007 uh, uh, episode with the Nazis uh, published our personal information. I was <laughs> you know, ready to run to, the, matter of fact, I did run to their schools and uh, alerted all their administrators to, to keep an eye out for my kids. But for myself and in terms of the work that I do, 
I don't know any other alternative. I, I, I get lauded for quote unquote persevering, but I can't think of what the alternative is. What do you what do you do? Do you, you know, especially if you have a job like, like I have, do you say, well, I'm not gonna write about this because this may make somebody angry. I can't touch that because that's gonna upset somebody. You do that and you're you're basically not doing the job that you were hired to do. So you're either you're either you're you're left with with a very stark choice. You either do the job or you don't do the job. But there's no half measures in doing the job, and certainly not because somebody has managed to uh, to instill you with fear. To me, that's not necessarily courage. Although I'm happy, you know, to, to be to be lauded for that. But to me, that's not necessarily courage. To me, that's just this is what I signed up for. This is the job, so I've got to do the job. Are there are there responses sometimes that counteract that? You know, the readers who then make you glad that you're doing what you're doing to counteract all the ugliness or some of that hateful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You hear, you hear, you know, I, I get marriage proposals. <laughs> I, get, I get, you know, I get, I get some of the loveliest letters. A couple of times I've had the experience of having somebody write to me. One, one gentleman wrote to me and said he'd asked me something about race 10 years ago. And I'd given him an answer. And apparently I was kind of world weary in it because he was, it was a challenging. It was a question by which he meant to challenge me. And it was something that I'd heard a hundred times before. So where he thought he was challenging me, I'm just sort of playing the, the tape on the loop in my head to answer it for him. And he says, uh, 10 years before, uh, he, he's referencing this when he writes me, he says, 10 years ago when you, when you did this, you know, I was, uh, I was kind of upset, but now I'm really, now I come to understand where you're coming from and I kind of see what you were writing about. And I'm really sorry for my point, my part in creating that fatigue that I saw wow. you 10 years ago. And so, you know, stuff like that really, really makes your day. Stuff like that is really nice to receive. It's, it's a nice antidote to some of the really crazy stuff that, that you receive that sort of drains your soul. Yeah. So when you, when you started writing about, you know, race and social justice more than three decades ago, not to age ourselves, but no, okay. you were really, you were a clear and singular voice on this topic, really. I mean, I mean, there were others, but you were really out in front on this. How have you been able to distinguish yourself now when there are so many other voices and also when anyone who has a laptop or a mobile device considers themselves to be a opinion writer? I don't really think in terms of who's out there doing this at the same time that I am. My, my only demand of myself is to, to do this to the best of my own ability. So I don't really spend a lot of time looking over my shoulder or looking to the side to see who's coming up behind me or what they're saying. You know, if, they, if they're making a good point, good on them. I'm, I'm, I'm glad for it, the more, the more the merrier, but I don't really measure myself in comparison, uh, in comparison with them. It's just not, it's not you know, the way I've, I've, I've worked. My the, only, my the only writer or pundit that I am in competition with is me. I've always felt that. Can I, can I do this? Can I say this better than I did five years ago? Can I, can I come up with a turn of phrase that I, that I didn't come up with before? Can I, can I find an angle on this that perhaps I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done before? That's to me is the competition, but as far as other writers, God bless them. And the more the merrier. And, and and over the years, have you have you changed the way that you tackle your work? In other words, be, circumstances have demanded a different type of, um, perhaps a different type of um, approach for you, or yeah, I or think not? I, I think I take a, a harsher tone now than I did, uh, say twenty or thirty years ago, and that's kind of a, a sad statement to me on where we've come. As a, as a nation, I look back on columns that I wrote in the late 90s or the early 2000s, and they feel sometimes almost unbearably earnest, almost unbearably naive when you consider what the country came to, when you consider what the country, you know, had, is and, and, and has been over the last uh, 10 to 12 years or so. Uh, it, just, it just really feels, uh, you know, it, I don't regret them because it's part of a natural, of a natural progression. And... I, as much as anybody else, am changing and have the right to change. But it's also it all, it also makes me sorry when you look at what we've come, what we and I have come from, uh, from the the way that we discuss race and the way that I discuss race in the in the late '90s to the way that it's discussed now. It's just uh, it's just really kind of a heartbreaking um, heartbreaking journey, and it didn't have to be this way. That's the part that frustrates 
frustrates me to no end. It did not have to be this way. And yet this is what we chose. Um, you know, like, like Lovejoy, your, your tool and your weapon, um, mm -hmm. depending on how you choose to use it, are your words and journalism. Yet, like everything, right? Not only are we in this moment of, you know, a, 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 another wave of racial reckoning, but journalism itself um, is under attack. Um, you know, facts are in dispute. Uh, and it's having an impact on our democracy, right? I and mean, it's a bedrock of our democracy. It's one of the few countries that's protected in the constitution. Um, and you see everything from the low voter turnout to our current political polarization. So why do you think Americans um, find it so difficult to find sources they can trust? Like, why are, why are we as journalists not trusted? And what is it that we can do or what to regain that trust? I don't know that there's a lack of trustworthy sources. I believe that the Miami Herald, the New York Times, uh, CBS News, NBC, CNN are as trustworthy now as they, as they would have been say 20 years ago, which is not to say they're perfect by any measure. They all have their biases, they all have their flaws, they all make their mistakes. But I don't think that there's been any great degradation of their trustworthiness. I think the issue is not so much a difficulty in finding trustworthy sources as there is a, an inclination to only consider trustworthy those sources that affirm what you've already chosen to believe. And once you give yourself permission to do that, then everything is on the table. And then we're all in, in, in a world of hurt. The, the new sources that I mentioned, a lot of times they tell me stuff that, or, or they confirm my opinion. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they, sometimes they make me angry. And sometimes, and, and, but, that's a, but that's a good thing. You know, sometimes they, they, they're at odds with what it is that I, that I wanna believe. But that's a good thing that helps to create intellectual rigor and it helps to create intellectual honesty rather than to be enthralled to some news source that only says what it is that I want to hear. That to me is the scariest uh, thing, uh, one of the scariest developments of the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years that this has become the norm, that we have become not, not just facts optional, but anti-fact, actively anti-factual. In so much of our in so much of our political dealings and social dealings, and so many of us don't seem to care, don't seem to notice, or don't seem to care. Right. That's that's scary because I don't know. The, the example that I use with people a lot when I give speeches is that if if we have the same pool of facts, we have this pool of facts that we're drawing from. I may choose to emphasize this. You may choose to emphasize that. You may say, well, this one doesn't work for me, but how about that? But it's, just, it's all the same pool. So if we have that same pool of facts, then we have the basis for a good, uh, good faith debate on whatever the issue is. But if your facts are way over here on the left and mine are way over here on the right, and they don't meet and they have nothing to do with each other, then we have no, no ability to, 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 to talk, to, to, to debate, honestly, because we're not even coming from the same place. And that's a very apt description, frankly, of where, we, where we've come to as a, as a, as a nation. And it's, it's scary, because again, I keep coming back to it, it didn't have to be. Is there a solution? I mean, what do we do about it? I mean, do you find yourself, you know, flipping over to Fox News every once in a while just to figure out like, what the other... No, I've got blood pressure issues, so, <laughs> so, so no. <laughs> Uh, I used to say back when he back when he was still on television four or five nights a week that John Stewart watched Fox, so I didn't have to, and I'd catch yeah. the high points. I'd catch the high points from him. I guess now Colbert does that, uh, but no, I, I, and this goes back to you before there was a Fox, back to the '80s. I have a very low tolerance for people for pe for for just abject outright lies. I like to think I have a pretty good tolerance for differences of opinion. If you have a different opinion from mine on almost any subject. If it's grounded in fact, if I can see a logic chain, I may not agree with you or you may persuade me, but I'm not going to dismiss you or it out of hand. But again, when I have, when I, when I've bothered to, to try to corral some fact and you have pulled some fairy dust out of the air and, t and tell me that it's fact, it's hard for me to take that seriously. It's hard for me to, to regard that with any kind of, any kind of respect. Uh, and that's, you know, the, again, that, that's kind of where we are. As a, as a nation, I was just reading, I forget what I was reading, but um, it was it mentioned Lewiston, Maine and the uh, influx of um, 
African uh, refugees, and I forget which nation they came from, but one of the complaints from the locals, from some of the locals who were hostile to this and threatened by this was that uh, all these people had to do was sign a piece of paper and they got a car. <laughs> it's like, what do you do with that? Right. What, what do you do with that? You, you, you can't talk about the stresses or the strains or the strengths and the values that having these people, this influx of people come in uh, causes or, or leaves you with, you can't even talk about that because you've got to spend time debunking the free car myth. And, that, and, and, that's, and that's all over the country all the time right now. Right. So, so right now, um, I mean, it's fitting in, in many ways that we're having this conversation right now as the world is watching the trial and the police killing of George Floyd. Um, you know, that obviously that videotaped incident along with the death of Breonna Taylor re-energized the Black Lives Matter movement and spurred protests, like you said, across the country and the world. Um, it seems perhaps that real change might be on the horizon or is it? I mean, from your perspective and your vantage point from looking at you know, decades from through the decades, what, what, what might be different this time or what needs to be different so that we can really move forward? I'm scared it's gonna be a moment and not a movement. Uh, I'm scared that, uh, for instance, that if Derek Chauvin is convicted, people are gonna say, well, problem solved, everything is okay. When, as I've been saying, and others have been saying for many years, the problem is bigger than any one case. The problem is bigger than the police department. And that's the right. thing that people don't seem to get. That we focus on and obsess on what happens with police because when police act out, of, act out structural racism, the results are more dire and more dramatic. Somebody gets shot, somebody gets killed, somebody ends up in jail who didn't deserve to be in jail. These things happen. But, by, but the structural racism that, that causes them to, to, to do that stuff also exists in journalism, it exists in banking, it exists in, in, in medicine, it exists in a lot of other places where perhaps the results are not as visceral and immediate. So I'm all for reforming the police and reimagining how we, how we police but I think we really need to focus our energies on dealing with the root of this, the structural causes of this. And I think it's incumbent upon us to do it sooner rather than later because the change that, people, that some people seem to be trying to forestall in terms of the demographics of this country, that change is not being, for, it's coming. You know, in a lot of ways, some of these folks are like, are like somebody standing astride a, um, a railroad track watching a speeding train come and going stop. Well, no, the train's not going to stop. The train's not going to stop. You're going to get hit. So, you know, there's a need to really figure out how to how to manage these structural stresses if we're going to have if we're going to continue to have a country. I, I, I firmly believe that. And I think that we are we're, we're, we're so far not proven up, up to the task. So what do you mean if you're going to still have a country? I mean, that's a pretty big. Yeah, I've been saying that for, for a couple of years. Yeah. I've been saying that for four years. And the interesting thing is when I first said it, I was kind of out there on my own talking about the fact that, you know, if, if we don't get this together, we could be looking at the end of this of this of the country as we know it. Uh, and what's fascinating to me is over that four years that I've been saying that other people have joined me. I, my, my feeling was, OK, pal, you're way out here on a limb you know, <laughs> in saying this. But what I've noticed is that the limb is getting crowded. Joe Biden said something like that last year. Kathleen Parker uh, has said something like that. Uh, Charles Blow has said something like that. There's a number of uh, there's a number of studies uh, that I uh, wrote about uh, in at the Fourth of July uh, in a Fourth of July piece last year. A number of studies and, and scholarly um, um, investigations all pointing to the same direction. And I think that as a country, there's a tendency for us as Americans to figure that our survival and indeed our victory is foreordained. I think that our history has kind of taught us that, you know, of, of course, the, the Union won at, at, at the, 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 Civil, the Civil War. Of course, uh, the Great Depression ended and we, when we went back to full productivity. Of course, we, be, we defeated the, the Japanese and the Germans and the, and the Italians in the Second World War. Of course, we did all these things as if it was preordained. And I think that the thing that really studying history teaches you is that none of it's preordained. None of our, none of our, our survival as a nation was or is preordained. And if we are to, to emerge from this moment, we need to act like America is at stake because I feel like America is. So there's, an, there's an urgency, I think, that we need that, to I, that I don't see enough to, of. To, to that end, I think mm -hmm. um, you know, so many of us 
here today, and I'm sure who are watching and hearing you today are just, you know, watching this country seemingly unravel before our very eyes right. and asking like, what can we do? And, you know, what can I do as an individual? And I remember in a speech that you gave a few years ago, you, you told that group, quote, in a time of great challenge, we cannot afford for the answer to be nothing. The answer to the question of what we can do. Mm -hmm. And you, 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 Gave you 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 shared a a Greek proverb um, that you is foundational mm -hmm. for you and I, and I would love if you could talk about like that and, and what you would say to us when we're like what do we do what can we do? The proverb is uh, society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they'll never sit in, and I saw that probably uh -huh. ten years ago on a on a door uh, in an office in Philadelphia and it's stuck with me ever since then. Because that, I think, is that statement. I think is key to what uh, is is missing a lot. Of it. Where is the investment in doing something that is not for me and now, but for them down the line, for my kids and for my kids' kids? And there seems to be so much short sightedness and so much fear governing so much of what we do. As as we were getting ready to come on, I was reading a, a New York Times piece on a study. Uh, from a gentleman who was surprised, he was he was surprised. I wasn't surprised at all that most of the uh, uh, of the uh, June the January sixth uh, insurrectionists were not motivated by financial insecurity as he had thought, but they were motivated by this by this fear that they're they're going to be replaced, that the you know that the blacks and Hispanics and the Muslims and all the rest of the stuff are going to replace them, and so that to me is sort of the great un discussed or in insufficiently discussed stressor that we face in this country. We need to figure out a way that we can all pledge allegiance to the ideal of America for real. A lot of us have given lip service to it over the years, but it's, if, we're, if, we're, if we are to be successful as a country, it's, it's that ideal that gets us through. We talk a lot about unity. But when you really look at American history, unity has often come in the face of or in the aftermath of some great existential threat. On, on September 11th, we were all there. On December 7th, we were all there. Uh, the November 22nd, we all wept together. But absent that, the question becomes, OK, what is it that binds us? What makes us a country? And I submit that it should be this sense of national mission, all, all these great words that the founders wrote for us about truths held self-evident and liberty and justice for all and all men created, create, all men and women created equal, all of those things. If we could find a way to, um, to put that into action and, be, and, to be ser and to ever be serious about it, uh, that to me is the thing that, that, would, that, would, that would most effectively bind us. But the question is, can we do that? People tend to be motivated more readily by what they fear than by what they hope. And that has been the story of so much of our politics right now. People, and so I think we've got to figure out a way to get people to want to move based on American ideals. Basically, there's a reason that this country, even in the throes of all that we're going through, even in the, even in the face of being a hot mess as we are, that people keep running here. What do they know that we tend to have forgotten? You know, we've got these these kids, you know, camped out in apparently, you know, hellish conditions at the at the border. We've got people trying to come in at, at, at the southern border. We've got people trying to come in at all these other borders. What is it that they know about what America is, can be and can do and can do for you that we, those of us who've been here a long time, or those of us who are native, have apparently forgotten or at the very least taken for granted? Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being long-winded. Let me just finish this. No, 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 no. This is great. This is exactly what I wanted but, to have. This yeah, let me just say this. That the, the, I, and I've written this in a column uh, that the issue is, you know, the problem is not America. It's Americans. <laughs> America, America is, is a brilliant set of ideals. Americans have historically decided to fall short of those ideals or historically fallen short of those ideals. And that's, that's the difficulty. If Americans could ever be as good as America, the ideal, we would have no problem. That's, a, that's definitely a high, uh, a high bar. Yeah. Not, 
necessarily unachievable, but it's called it's called to achieve a more perfect union. But we don't ever, but we don't ever perfect the union, as Obama was so fond of uh, of saying. There's always something to do. You know, Leonard, you um you have five children. I mean, five children and thirteen grandchildren. So yes, you, yes. when you think about the future, I'm sure that it's their images that 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 you that come to your mind. And so by now, so many of us have learned about the talk that black parents have to have with their children. It's not about the birds and the bees, right? So it's the self-preservation, um, self-protection talk. Um, can you talk about, um, you know, like I said, giving your career and how you have had to confront this, you know, professionally, but also personally, how you and Marilyn dealt with, 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 with their children? How did you confront like the issue of growing up in a country that's not yet colorblind, even though we elected a black president, seemed like it just right. actually set us back. But how did you deal with that on a personal level with your own family? One of the most frustrating things as a parent is that moment when you realize that you can't protect your son or your daughter and you have to admit this to your son or your daughter. And I'm sure that, that comes to a lot of parents in, in, in various and sundry ways. But for an African American parent, one way that it comes invariably uh, is that it is in that thing where you have where they have felt or dealt with some inequality, some inequity, uh, some unfairness or mistreatment based on the color of their skin, and you have to tell them that this is how it is, and there's nothing that that you're going to be able to do to change that. One of the most frustrating things about racism that, that people who don't experience it don't really understand is the impersonal nature of it. Because you're, 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 logically, if you're walking down the street and people are treating you a certain way, your thought as a, per, as a human being is gonna be, what, can, what did I do to deserve this? What can I do to, to fix this so that I don't receive this, this treatment? But if you're African-American, one of the things you learn is it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how much you achieve or don't. It doesn't matter how good you are or not. That treatment is always, is always gonna be there. There's a bitter old joke uh, that sort of speaks to it. What do you call a black man with a PhD? And the, the punchline is the N word. And that to me, and that to me is the whole thing in a nutshell. So to have to explain that to a kid, because kids are kids and they want the whole world to be their oyster and they, you know, they're, in, they're invincible and they're invulnerable and they want to go out there and conquer. Yeah, you don't want to squash that. You don't want to also, yeah. right? Like, yeah, what's exactly. the balance? Exactly. You want them to have that, but you also have to help them understand that there's this thing that you're going to have to deal with, that I had to deal with, that your mom had to deal with, that your grandparents and their parents had to deal with, and that it's just there. And there's, I, I, there's no magic formula that's going to help you overcome it. There's no, nothing that you can do. There's no personal excellence that you're going to do that's going to exempt you from it. It's just there. And the thing that you have to come to understand and internalize is at the end of the day, it's not your problem. It's your problem in the sense that you deal with its, with its, with its effects and its impacts, but it's not your problem in the sense that you cause it. It's somebody else's problem and, the, and something that they need to, 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 to deal with. Well, the reality is that your grandchildren, for instance, are part of a generation that is already um, majority minority, right? Yeah. 18 and under. Yeah. Um, do you, do you, so like you said, the trades coming demographic change, you know, is, mm -hmm. is, is here really. Um, do you see hope in that, in that, in the younger generation? Um, let's, let's say guardedly, <laughs> um, because here's my thing. I've been, I've been hearing people say the younger generation will fix it, the younger generation will make change since I was a member of the younger generation, <laughs> which I haven't been for a while now. So, you know, that always makes me look uh, with a little bit of a jaundiced eye toward people who say, well, look at the, the kids, they all play together. They don't have the hangups that we did. They're, 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 you know, they're much better than we are. Yeah, but kids have a way of growing up to become us. <laughs> yeah, I know, heaven help us all, right? Kids have a way of growing up to become us. So I, so I have guarded hope. Let's, we'll call it that. So you, you have really, you have gone oftentimes, you know, beyond. I know that you're known for, you know, obviously race and justice, but justice mm -hmm. you apply pretty broadly. And I remember in 2014, you 
you traveled to the Appalachias and, uh, uh, and you wrote about, uh, you wrote a really great series about white poverty. And it's worth right. mentioning that this was a full two years before Donald Trump harnessed the despair of that group in America right. to help propel him to the presidency. Um, and I know the Herald received just incredible feedback about your humanity mm. in really telling their story. Um, so you saw something there that like other politicians didn't even see. You went to a group of people that felt very unseen and neglected. Can mm. you talk about that and what, what made you go there and what you learned from that trip? Well, Dr. King said uh, one time that he had been fighting too too long and too hard against racial segregation to segregate his moral concerns, which is a quote that I've always liked. Um, to me, it, it's not such a great leap for, because for me, the issue is not so much that I argue for, argue against racial discrimination, although I do. To me, the, in, the issue is I argue against injustice based on whatever tribe you happen to belong to. Uh, it, if, I, if all I argue is, is for justice when it, when it deals with people who look like me, that's not principle, that's self-interest. But if my concern is how can we have the greatest amount of justice for everybody, for all of God's children, then to me, that's, that's, the, that's the gold standard. That's what, that's what we should be look, uh, uh, looking for. So when I went to Appalachia, yeah, I was, I was, I was fascinated by this. And it's like something that that doesn't really get discussed a lot, although it's becoming uh, more discussed now with uh, Hillbilly Elegy, uh, the book by J.D. Vance and, and some other stuff. But yeah. people re didn't really talk up so much about this. We, whenever we talk about poverty in, in, in news media, we always put a black or brown face on it. And it's true that those communities have a greater uh, proportion of their, of their members in poverty. But in terms of just total numbers, the white poor in this country outnumber the black, brown, and Asian poor combined. <laughs> it's just a huge group and nobody sees them, nobody talks about them. So I, I really wanted to, what I did in that Herald story, I, I sat down with a map, see if I could find the whitest, poorest place in America and, and let's go there and see, and see what it's like. And it was, it was really a fascinating uh, piece, a really a fascinating experience. One of the things that jumped out at me, you kind of alluded to it, was that uh, they are wary, like African Americans and, and Hispanic Americans a lot of times, they are wary of media because they feel like they've been caricatured by media so often. Right. And after that piece ran, I heard from a number of the people, so, you know, just gratified that they had shown up in a, in a, in a you know, big newspaper piece in a form that was recognizable to them, in a form that wasn't a caricature or, or a cartoon. Uh, and that was important to me to achieve, to sort of to sort of be able to reflect the humanity of of of, of these folks. To me, was some was something that was very important to me to achieve, and something that you don't see done very often. So again, it's it's all it's it always comes down to the the human thing to 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 human beings suffering. That's why I, I write about women's issues. That's why I, why why I write about uh, anti-Semitism. Why I write about LGBTQ issues. It to me, it's all part of the same the same story. So um, a few years back, I was at a, I want to talk a little bit about the craft. So a few years back, I remember, I, I remember meeting a middle school teacher from Texas and she told me that she used your columns to teach her students how to write. Yeah. She specifically noted what I would call your spare but powerful prose, um, how she would tell her students how you could make a one word, a paragraph, and it worked, you know, it was uh, so right, just pow. Um, but yet you're often tackling these really complex issues um, and conceptual topics. And unlike your colleagues on the new side, you got to stick to a word count, same word right. count, you know, uh, every time you, uh, you sit at the keyboard. So can you talk about how you approach, because really your writing is just you know, in its simplicity, so beautiful that I know it's, it must be a hell of a lot of work. Right? You yeah. something so it's funny, it you should, easy, but. it's funny you should say that because when I first started writing columns, I'd been writing professionally for probably 20 some years and I figured, okay, I can do this. I can knock this out. But writing a column is its own discipline. Even if you've been doing other stuff, 
sitting down to write a column is a whole different thing. And there's a learning curve. When I look at the stuff I wrote, the first columns I wrote for the Herald, I kind of cringe because they're so, <laughs> they seem so flabby to me. There's just so much there. Cut this, cut that, take this out. Because the trick with a column is to be able to, you're, you're, you're dealing with very thorny, complex, knotty issues, and you're moving at a very brisk pace because again, you've got that 600 some odd word uh, count, 145 line count that you, that you don't wanna go over, but it's gotta look like it's leisure. That's, that's, that's the magic <laughs> trick of a column, you know? And what my, my philosophy, and I tell this to young writers all the time, is every word has to earn its right to be there. And when you're editing, when you're writing, whatever, every word has to earn the right to be there. And if it's not, if it's not giving you uh, information, if it's not imparting information, rhythm, or color, if it's not doing one of those three things, then it needs to come out. If you can take it out and the sentence doesn't change, then you have to ask yourself why it's there. So I like to, when I edit, I'm, I'm always looking for stuff that could come out and not change, uh, not change the meaning or the, or the flow of the sentence. And that's one of the things that column writing teaches you. Column writing teaches you to be very economical with language. And that's, that's, a, good, that's a good skill to have. And you're also making an argument, so you have to make sure that, I mean, I guess you have to be really clear on what it is you're right. trying to, you want to convey, and, and then right. how you structure to make the point, right. and, yeah. and, you know, start to finish, I think it is a, an art form. Yeah, and you have to account for what the counter arguments are going to be, so that you can answer those in advance when somebody makes a counter argument. There's all this stuff, and you've got to, it's got to kind of have a flow to it, it's got to be entertaining, and then you got to stick the landing. And, and make sure that the kicker has a nice, you know, punch to it. It's it's its, its own thing. And again, uh, all the other stuff that I've done prior to that really didn't prepare me for it. I had to kind of learn that in the process of doing it. Well, you've learned you've learned well. I'm <laughs> going to ask you one more question before sure. we uh, we. I know there's going to be a bunch of questions from the participants, but I want to have it just a little bit. People may not know this about you, but you started your career as actually a music. Right. Critic. In fact, when you came to the Miami Herald, you were a music critic. So um, I guess I wanted to ask you um, about your best best live performance and, and maybe um, the, 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 or maybe the, you would be surprised to know that so-and-so is really great live or, or maybe our worst, your worst live performance. Oh, and, you know, I, I think the terrible live performances are sort of, no, nope, I was about to have, a, have escaped from my mind, but no, there was a Natalie Cole show back when she, when she was still unfortunately dealing with her alcohol issues. And we happened to be backstage at, in the intermission, my wife and I, because we were talking to her opening act, Peaches and Herb, and we saw her sort of backstage dancing around drunkenly with champagne on and she spilled it on her, this white suit and her attendants were, were just going crazy trying to make her presentable to go out on stage. And we came out there and she was just not in shape to give a show. We'll just say that. And people wow. just, people started, people started walking out on her. That and the Whitney Houston concert in Miami in 91. Whitney was pretty terrible too. Whitney was uh, two hours late and then arrived to the stage with an attitude, which is a really bad combination of things to do. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't yeah. really, and, and Miami's a tough crowd, but and, and yeah. so, and I, and, I, and I was told by, by one of your colleagues, you know, um, one of my friend and your friend and colleague, Howard Cohen, that yeah. there was a particular um, review that you wrote for the Miami Herald, a Neil Diamond, which by the way, just trying to picture you at a Neil Diamond concert <laughs> is like, hey, you know, I, I was once I dragged everything. to a Neil Diamond concert too, so I, I confess, but that, you got to have a lot of letters out of that one apparently too, huh? Yeah, Neil Diamond, because <laughs> it was Neil actually Diamond kind of fans. It was actually kind of funny because I actually didn't pan him, but I said that the audience was kind of dead. He was working his, he was singing his heart out and they were just sort of kind of comatose and readers didn't like that. And somebody wrote me a letter and said, that's how middle-aged people express excitement. <laughs> <laughs> there was no answering that. What can I do? Yeah, okay, you're, I guess you're right. Yeah, I definitely remember that. I definitely remember. Thank you, Howard, for remembering that. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely recall that the, the Neil Diamond show. But he was he was great. It's just his audience didn't seem to. There was no energy in the room. I remember that. That's great. Yeah. Well, Kimberly, I know you have some questions, and I know, um, and I could keep asking Leonard questions forever, but I'll I'll turn it over to you so you can ask some questions and get audience questions too. Great. Thank you so much, Mindy, for leading that conversation and. Greetings to everyone from Colby's campus and a shout out to Colby 
students, faculty, and staff who we know are watching in person from our Lorimer Chapel tonight. Um, I'm gonna be facilitating questions from the audience for the last um, bit of our event this evening. We already have had a lot of questions come through, so thank you for that. But for those that are watching live and wanna give questions right now, please do, it's just on the site. If, you're, if you've expanded your screen, you might have to minimize your screen to see it, um, but there's a place right there for you to add your questions. So keep those coming um, as we're talking. Um, I'm gonna start with, um, so Leonard, you talked about how you've covered social and racial justice, you know, for mm -hmm. decades and how it's been a heartbreaking journey because it's some heavy stuff. And you also mentioned how, you know, of course you get the fan mail, but you also get the hate mail and the hate mail can uh -huh. drain your soul. My favorite question that we've gotten was from someone, um, Lee Hendricks sent this in. And Lee asks, how do you restore your soul to keep writing with such passion and truth? <laughs> Well, um, there's uh, Motown music. There's always something good on Netflix. Uh, I got my, my Marvel Comics stuff. I got my wife. Should have mentioned her first. No, God, I just blew that one. Blew that one right out of the water. I got my wife and my and my family. So you know, the, the, there's there's a place for me to retreat to, to retreat to when you're kind of on the front lines and and, and really dealing with a lot of this stuff. Uh, it can come to seem like it's the whole world. And at some point you really have to, you really have to just sort of put it aside uh, with the understanding that what, what, it, what will be, will be. And go and play with your grandkids. You know, go, go play with your, with your granddaughter. My granddaughter, uh, Maya, you know, is at that perfect age. She's five years old. And, you know, when she's here, she's bouncing around the house or something. And I usually go and tickle her or something like that when I'm, <laughs> you know, tickling Maya when I'm having a, when, I, when it's a bad day is usually a good, pick me up. That's a great segue to the next question because you talked with Mendy about that self-protection talk you have to have mm -hmm. with your family. Um, but Judy Balecki, um, sorry, Judy, if I said your last name wrong, but wrote in talking, um, she was curious about, was there a particular age or event when you realized yourself that being black in America was going to mean a different daily life for you than a white person? And if so, you know, when was that moment and how, how did it affect you? I don't know so much that that happened, but I do remember clearly the moment when I first became aware of myself as an African-American person in a, in, a, in, a, in a place that wasn't. I grew up in the era of segregation and my, so segregated was my neighborhood that I was utterly convinced that Los Angeles was a predominantly white, a predominantly African-American city because I didn't see any white people. Mm -hmm. The only white people were uh, teachers, cops who drove by and other than that they were on uh on television they were in on the ponderosa and they lived in mayberry and stuff like that but in terms of actually being real you know they they, they simply weren't and i remember one time we went to the uh we took a school field trip went to the la zoo and i remember clearly a couple things i remember one i remember all these blonde kids spilling out of their buses and running to see the animals and i remember thinking with the earnestness of a child uh, how how are their parents going to be able to tell which one is which because they all look so much alike? And I'm like nine or ten years old. <laughs> yeah. like, and I also remember standing in front of the uh, the gorilla cage with this uh, this uh, white girl. She was about four feet uh, away from me, and I remember being almost as fascinated by her as I was by the gorilla. I was like, oh wow, you're that she's real. That that that, that that's real. But that's how deep the segregation was. The other thing I remember from that day, which is kind of, I don't know where it came from. But obviously, I had some kind of racial conscious. Even at that point, they gave us box lunches of fried chicken, and I had heard somewhere along the way that fried chicken was a stereotype, and that black people supposedly had an un, un a natural love of, of fried chicken. And I do like fried chicken, but I didn't eat fried chicken that day. I didn't eat lunch that day. I went home hungry, and to me, that is such a to to have that consciousness at, I don't know, maybe eight years old, eight years old or something like that. To have that consciousness to to in order to to skip of cold fried chicken, I, it just makes me sad when I think about it, that somehow I, I had picked this up, that fried chicken was a, was a bad thing. You, you didn't eat fried chicken around white people. It just, that just really, it, you know, it didn't bother me so much then, but it bothers me as an adult looking back on that little kid. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of questions that we've gotten that I think you've mm -hmm. kind of already addressed on this issue of kind of where is our country mm -hmm. headed and what can we do to turn racism mm -hmm. around? Um, but Katie Mitran wrote, um, talking about, she had hope in terms of what's happening with the Black Lives Movement. I loved mm -hmm. your comment earlier about how we hope it's not a moment, but a movement. 
right. but she she talks about how um, what's happening right now with voter suppression in Georgia and other states that it makes her scared. Yeah. Um, so I'd like for you to talk a little bit about um, what your thoughts are around voter suppression happening right now in this country. Well, what's troubling is that we used to be dealing, the, the people who were suppressing African-American votes, they used to have a, a, a fig leaf of deniability. And now it's not a fig leaf, it's a piece of saran wrap. It's pretty obvious what they're doing. Uh, and if it weren't obvious, some of them have actually said as much, like the gentleman in, I believe it was Arizona, we don't believe that everybody should vote. And, and other people have made statements like this, which to me is a, is a sign of the desperation, uh, again, of, of, of a group of people who have enjoyed an, un, an unbroken hold on power for all these years. And now the demographics say that power is gonna have to be something that is shared among, among all these groups. It doesn't say that it's gonna be a black majority or a Hispanic majority. It says that nobody's gonna have a majority. Mm -hmm. And to me, I see that as challenging, but not scary. That's challenging. It means, okay, we're going to have to figure out where, where you know, what, what America looks like from here, where we go from here. But for a lot of people, it, it's, it's downright terrifying. The example that I use a lot of times is if you have been the lead singer of the group, if you've been Gladys Knight for 400 years and now all of a sudden you're just a pip, uh, that's a little bit difficult. And I think that's kind of where, where a lot of white Americans find themselves now. They, they feel like they've been demoted from being the lead of, of this American group to being just a part of the ensemble, but the ensemble only works because, watch me extend this analogy, but the ensemble only works because they all work together to create harmony. They work together to create a sound, you know, together. So, it, it, and to me, that's, that's not a bad thing. This whole idea that, okay, you're the lead and the rest of us are your backup, that's kind of gone. That's that's gone, and you can stand on the on the on the track and, and you know hold your hand up to the train all you want. That's kind of gone. So if you're smart and if you're forward thinking and if you love this country, then you need to start thinking about what what the future is going to look like, what America is going to look like post 2040. That's the only way, you know. Because here's the bottom line: the Muslims are not going back to the to the margins. The gay people aren't going back to the closet. The African Americans aren't going back to the back of the bus, the women aren't going back to the kitchen. That ship is safe, you know? And you need to figure out, you need to, to accommodate yourself to that and deal with the new realities of this country. So I have to mention, because mm -hmm. we're talking about racial disparities and, and, and we've mentioned already about criminal justice issues, but tomorrow night, the Goldfarb Center has um, Anthony Ray Hinton. I don't know if you know that name, he's a, he was on death row for 30 years and mm -hmm. wrongly convicted of a crime. And um, Brian Stevenson of the fame of Justice, oh, yes, yes. Justice Initiative um, helped get him released in 2015. Um, I bring that up because we have a question from Andrew Ordenlich, who's a junior here at Colby. And he asks, um, or states as well, from police misconduct to mass incarceration, the criminal justice system in this country has exacerbated racial disparities over and over again. And what reforms do you advocate for um, to equalize that racial justice? Now, I know you've already touched on this a little bit and talked about how it's important to focus on the, the causes, the structural racism right. issues in this country. But I still want to bring it up specifically around, you know, criminal justice, you know, issues that are much broader than just police um, conduct and police issues. But right. are there other things um, that you kind of advocate or focus in on on those issues? Well, I believe that it's time or it's past time that we decriminalize drug use and treat it as a public health issue and not as a, as a criminal issue. We cannot, we, you cannot jail or incarcerate people out of wanting whatever illicit substances they want. Uh, that just, it, it's never worked. Uh, it, it didn't work uh, during prohibition. Uh, it's not working during what some would call this new prohibition. Uh, the, the numbers, of, of, of addiction, the numbers of, of, of use of drugs, all these things don't, don't fluctuate according to us, according to us spending, I think it's a trillion dollars, if I'm not mistaken, over 30 some years and, and jailing all of these people. We haven't, we haven't made a dent in, 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 in the drug issue. We have not. So I think that the best thing that we can do is to treat this as a public health issue uh, and, and 
and and try to try to, to to deal with it from from that standpoint because jailing people clearly hasn't worked. And when you've got people doing 25 and uh, 25 and 30 years on the on these insane um, min, uh, maximum uh, min, minimum mandatory sentences for nonviolent first time drug offenses and, and and your life is gone. There's something crazy with that. And then, it's, mm -hmm. and then as, the, as the gentleman said, when you factor in the racial disparities uh, in terms of in terms of who gets jailed and who gets prosecuted and who even gets arrested, then it becomes that much worse. There's an example that I like in um, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, where she talks about uh, a um, a uh, district attorney deciding that he's not he's going to go easy on a uh, on a white drug dealer because he's quote it's not like he's quote some drug some gun toting drug dealer this is a white mm -hmm. kid with a gun rack on the back of his pickup truck but but when we say a gun toting drug dealer he's not what we have in mind he's mm -hmm. literally a gun toting drug dealer but he's not what we have in mind and so this kid gets a break that a black kid you know with with a, with a Glock in his pants or whatever doesn't get even though they are doing the same thing and are and are both armed and that's that's insane. Hmm. Yeah, um, I sh I would be remiss if I didn't say um, why there aren't any marriage proposals. There are a lot of comments <laughs> coming in um, saying that they're so grateful for you speaking with us tonight and that they've read you for years and how much they appreciate your thinking. Thank you. Um, so know that that's coming in from a number of your fans. Thank um, you. I, and one of those fans looks like she's a professor here at Colby. She teaches sociology, Professor Anna Hikido who says that she grew up uh, reading your columns in the San Jose Mercury News. And her question, and also a comment is around, you know, we have a polarized climate right now. We are quick to equate disagreement with hostility. And she asks, do you have experiences when you disagreed with someone but found it productive? And what thoughts do you have about creating spaces that prioritize facts while still leaving room for different opinions. You talked about this earlier in terms of the news, of course, but um, I don't know if she's going this way, but I'll say, you know, what about on a personal level? I used to be able to have those discussions 15, 20 years ago. It was more, it was more likely possible to have those discussions, but the climate, as I've experienced it at least, has changed uh, to the degree that those discussions are almost impossible to have, at least, in, again, speaking only from my narrow experience, I found those, those discussions impossible to have. And I used to like those discussions because I'm, I'm under no illusion that I have the, the key to all wisdom. Somebody else may have an idea that I didn't think of that I need to, to, to be turned on to, but that atmosphere no longer exists. And in a large part, it's because of this whole anti-fact movement. As I said, I can, I can take whatever difference of opinion that you have, but if, you have, if I have fact and you have anti-fact, that I, I cannot condone this idea that I should treat the, the anti-fact with the same respect that I should that I would treat fact. That is just something. That's a step that I can't that I can't make because then I'm not I'm not challenging what needs to be challenged. I'm basically comforting you in in your delusion. So that you know that's that's where I can't that's where I can't go and that's where where, where I draw the line. And unfortunately, so much of of, of the debate now in in our politics is about fact versus anti-fact. And mm -hmm. I don't know what to do with that. I really don't. It, to, to return to the Lewiston example I mentioned, when, when, you're, when your baseline, when your truth is they sign their names and they get free cars, where's my free car? How can I discuss immigration? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How can we have an informed discussion on, on, on immigration in Lewiston when that is your baseline and your belief? And I hear that, I hear echoes of that, that kind of thing all the time. So in terms of solutions, if that's what we're talking about, I don't think that there is a short-term solution. I think it took us a long time to get here. It's going to take us a long time to get out. I think we're going to need to have the schools do a much, much better job of teaching two things, media, well, a couple of things, media literacy, civics, and um, I feel I'm having a Rick Perry moment, uh, media, media uh, civics, and whatever the third thing is. Oops, I think Rick Perry said, but... Uh, but you know, to 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 oh, critical thinking. Thank you. Uh, I think that there's a need to, to 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 teach kids not what to think, but how to think. How to find information. How to 
how to uh, vet information, how to value or not value information. I think that that is critically important. I think news media, and I, I think you're already starting to see this, but I think news media need to get rid of this trope of, uh, of false equivalence and both sideism because that has really just been disastrous for us as an institution and for the, uh, for the country. And then I think that uh, social media, there has to be some kind of price to pay for putting out just absolute nonsense. So there's a book by Nathan Bomey um, called, uh, I forget the name of Nathan's first book, but he had, he had a book uh, about this whole anti-fact movement. He documents the fact that Facebook and Facebook in particular, people have, have been injured and people have died because of misinformation that was spread on these, on these platforms. That's scary. So we have to find some solution that, that, that respects the First Amendment and the First Amendment rights of, of people to, to, to express themselves however they want to express with the need to find some way to curtail uh, this absolute this nefarious dissemination of stuff that simply isn't true. And it is not, and it is not disseminated because the person disseminating it had an honest mistake or honestly didn't know, but it's but is disseminated with nefarious intent is disseminated in order to hurt America, in order to hurt the, the country, or in order to hurt whatever country it might, it might be dealing with. Uh, that is, you know, that, those are the, the things that I would recommend that we need to do. And Nathan Bomey's book was called After the Fact. Mm. We have a lot of great questions coming in. It's always the case at the end, right, when we're running out of time. Um, so we're gonna, only going to do one more question, but I just do want to say a shout out from uh, Gertrude Beal says you have a lot of fans in Greensboro, North Carolina. I guess you've spoken to the New Garden Friends Meeting and Gilbert yes. College. Um, yes. And Jared yeah. Payne also says thank you for each column, each book, and each speech. Thank you. But what I want to end on is a question from George S., um, which is a great question to end on, so thank you, George. <laughs> And the question is, can you tell us why Colby's Lovejoy Award is relevant um, and important and how you feel about being this year's recipient? And I'll just add any other closing remarks you wanna to add to that, Leonard. Uh, I am honored beyond words uh, to, 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 to receive an award in the name of Elijah Parrish Lovejoy. Uh, when the award was first announced to me, I believe they said a lot. They, they said him. They, they mentioned his full name, Elijah Parrish Lovejoy, and I didn't really recognize it because I've always known him as Elijah P. Lovejoy in the history book where I first read about it. But when I finally put two and two together, as you can see, the brain works slowly sometimes, but it, but it does still work. When I finally put two and two together, I was awed to think that I would get an award named in in, in honor of Elijah Lovejoy. For those of you who don't know, who don't know, Elijah Lovejoy was this 19th century hero of journalism, this 19th century badass, who uh, was a white guy who wrote against editorials against slavery. And uh, they kept telling him, you better stop this stuff or you're going to get hurt. And they came three times, I believe it was, and destroyed his printing press. And he each time either repaired or, or got a new printing press and kept talking about the evils of slavery. The fourth time they came, they destroyed the printing press and they shot him to death. Uh, and I think it was John Quincy Adams called him the first American martyr to freedom of the press. So to think that I am, you know, if he's here to think I'm, you know, way somewhere even in, 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 the, in the same sentence, in the same paragraph uh, with Elijah Parrish Lovejoy is, is really is really an honor because he, you know, he laid it all on the line and he did it. And this really is attractive to me. He did it in a cause that, that he had no firsthand involvement in. He wasn't uh, enslaved. He wasn't likely to be enslaved. He was a white guy. So, you know, it sort of vindicates my feeling that I, that I mentioned a moment ago, that the issue is not about self-interest. It's about the larger human tribe, about who's being, uh, who's being oppressed, who's being stopped, who's being stepped on, who's being suppressed in their voting, and that we all have an obligation. Each of us has an obligation to whoever it is in our in our human family that is in need, that is being that is being left out, uh, looked over, you know, denigrated, denied, whatever. We all have an we all have a, an obligation to that person, and that's what Lovejoy, uh, that's what Lovejoy embodied, and uh, it's what I try to embody in writing the column. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mendy, for helping facilitate tonight's conversation. Congratulations, Leonard, for this well-deserved award. 
um, in the name of someone I think you are very close to. No. <laughs> I wish. I would, I would shorten that gap a bit. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who's watching um, and who sent in wonderful questions and comments. We're grateful for you all being here. And Linda, we're grateful for your courageous journalism. And please keep writing. Thank you Thank and you. have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.